All right, chemistry, let's get working to complete section five of chapter six. Now, this is going to be a packed section. So this may be one that's going to be longer, but it's also going to be one that you're going to need to watch more than once. So in this video, I want you to be able to explain a Vesper theory. I want you to predict the shapes of molecules or polyatomic ions using Vesper theory. I want you to explain how the shapes of molecules are accounted for by hybridization theory. I want you to describe dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, uh, induced dipoles, and London dispersion forces, and their effects on properties such as boiling and melting points. Explain... Lastly, explain the shapes of molecules or polyatomic ions using Vesper theory. So let's get started on this dense, dense section. We're going to use the term molecular geometry, right? It's the shape of a molecule. And so we're talking about covalently bonded items here. If we're talking about the shape of ionically bonded uh, units, we would use the term crystal lattice, right? The, the shape of the actual the, the crystalline geometry. Here we're talking about molecular geometry. And so if you remember our uh, portion of this chapter dedicated to covalent bonding, the word molecule uh, specifically, explicitly infers covalent bonding. <clears throat> so the properties of molecules depend not only on the bonding of the atoms, but also on the molecular geometry, which is the three-dimensional arrangement of a molecule's atoms. Three-dimensional arrangement of those molecule's atoms. The polarity of each bond, along with the geometry of the molecule, determines its molecular polarity, or the uneven distribution of molecular shape. So we're going to try to connect that word polarity, which is kind of a foggy word in and of itself. We're going to try to connect that word polarity to an uneven distribution, specifically, of electrons. Molecular polarity strongly influences the forces that act between molecules in liquids and solids. And the liquids and solids part will be a, a lesson for another day. But for today, we want to remember that a chemical formula by itself reveals actually little information about a molecule's geometry. So we're going to get into Vesper theory here. As shown at right, diatomic molecules like those of hydrogen, which is H2, or hydrogen chloride, which is HCl, can only be linear because they consist of only two atoms, right? You can't arrange them in space any different way. You'd get something that is linear in a line. To predict the geometries of more complicated molecules, however, one must consider the locations of all of the electron pairs surrounding the bonding atoms. This is the basis of Vesper theory. And so when we move from drawing simple Lewis structures using electron dot notation, identifying where the bonding atoms are and where the lone pairs of electrons are, as we move forward in our understanding, and, and paint this real life picture of molecules, we have to start using the location of those lone pairs of electrons to help inform us of molecular geometry. So we are going to use <clears throat> an acronym that is VESPER, V-S-E-P-R theory. The abbreviation, the abbrevi uh, abbreviation VESPER stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. So VESPER theory states that repulsion between the sets of valence-level electrons, and notice it's only valence-level, not the inner shell electrons, not the kernel electrons, only the outer shell, the valence-level electrons, surrounding an atom causes these sets uh, uh, to be oriented as far away as possible, which makes sense because we already know that electrons repel one another, and so they will move away from each other as far apart as is possible. For example... <clears throat> In beryllium fluoride, the central beryllium atom is surrounded by only the two electron pairs it shares with fluorine atoms, meaning that there are no lone pairs around beryllium. According to Vesper theory, the shared pairs, right, the shared pairs, which, which would be the bonding pairs, the electrons involved in a bond, the shared pairs will be as far away from each other as possible. So the bonds to fluorine, the beryllium to fluorine bonds, will be oh, 180 degrees from each other. 
the molecule will therefore be linear. It will form a line. Representing the central atom in a molecule by A and the atoms bonded to that central atom by B, then according to Vesper theory, BeF2, which is that beryllium fluoride, is an example of AB2, which is linear. In an AB3 molecule, the three AB bonds, right, the three surrounding B atoms all bonded to that central A, they stay farthest apart by pointing to the corners of an equilateral triangle, which if you remember your geometry, equilateral triangles have 120 degree angles between the corners. And so AB3 molecules will have 120 degree angles between the bonds. In an AB4 molecule, the distance between the electron pairs is maximized if each A to B bond points to one of four corners of a tetrahedron, a four-sided shape. Not a square, because a square is only in two dimensions. Remember, molecular geometry is taking advantage of three dimensions. And so here are some examples of Vesper and basic molecular shapes. We have the linear shape, which we've already shown with beryllium, beryllium fluoride. Right, so that AD, AB2 format but with the uh, uh, sulfur trioxide will have the trigonal planar shape, right, which is that AB3 shape, trigonal planar. Then we'll have something like methane, CH4, which has a central carbon atom surrounded by hydrogen spread out at four corners. Again, not a square because a square is only two dimensional. With molecular theory, we need uh, molecular geometry. We need to take advantage of all three dimensions, and so we'll spread out into what's called a tetrahedron. And then, if we get a little bit crazier, for example, with a central phosphorus atom and then five chlorine atoms surrounding it, I know this looks like C. It's actually a typo in, in the graph. This actually should be Cl on all of them. Uh, carbon would not have three lone pairs, and so this is a typo. This should all be Cls. This central phosphorus, if we have five CLs, five chlorines bonded to that central phosphorus, the way that these bonding electrons, right, that bond the phosphorus to each chlorine, the way that they can spread out maximally is by forming what's called a trigonal bipyramidal shape. <coughs> so, as a sample, let's answer a question that you would have to answer on a quiz or on a test. Oh, too far. Use Vesper theory to predict the molecular geometry of boron trichloride, so a central boron surrounded by three chlorines. Let's take a look how we would do this. First, we need to draw the Lewis structure for BCl3. Now we know that boron is in group 13 and has three valence electrons, so we would draw the electron dot notation as such. Chlorine is in group 17, so we know that it's going to have seven valence electrons. Therefore, we would draw the electron dot notation for chlorine as such, right? Next step, after we've drawn the Lewis structures, now we will total the number of electrons, knowing that we have three electrons coming from the boron, and then we have a total of 21 electrons coming from the chlorine for a grand total of 24 electrons. And so this Lewis structure uses all 24 electrons successfully. So this is the appropriate Lewis structure for boring trichloride, BCl3. But we're not just doing um, Lewis structures here. We're trying to predict the molecular geometry. We now know that boron trichloride is an AB3 format. And so the geometry should be trigonal planar. And yes, you will have to associate, meaning memorize, you have to associate the AB3 format with a trigonal planar shape. Vesper theory can also account for geometries of mo uh, molecules with unshared electron pairs, meaning those lone pairs of electrons, with the examples being ammonia, which is NH3, or water, H2O. The Lewis structure for ammonia shows that the central nitrogen atom has one unshared electron pair, one lone pair. And we can see that bad boy right here, right on top. It's not involved in bonding. <coughs> Vesper theory postulates that the lone pair occupies space, right? 
The electrons are very, very small. They have very, very little mass, but they have quite a bit of charge. They have, you know, a full charge. And so they are repelling the bonds, or sorry, should I say the electrons that are forming the bonds between the nitrogen and the hydrogens. And so they have just as much repulsion as any of the other electrons. Right? So these lone pairs of electrons will occupy space around the nitrogen atoms just like the bonding pairs do. And so if we take into account its unshared pair, uh, NH3 takes a tetrahedral shape, just like an AB4 molecule. Okay, so now we're getting tricky. Now we're getting tricky. Now as we go forward to try to make a little bit of sense of um, how NH3 looks like an AB3 format, but it really acts like an AB4 format, let's distinguish between shape and geometry. The shape, and I will use this language on quizzes and on tests. <clears throat> the shape of a molecule, the shape of a molecule refers to the positions of atoms only. Only atoms. If I say shape, I'm asking how do the atoms arrange themselves. If I ask for geometry, right, geometry, I am asking you to take into account the lone pairs of electrons. Not just the atoms, it's the atoms plus the lone pairs of electrons. So H2O has two unshared pairs of electrons. Its molecular geometry takes the shape of, <clears throat> sorry, um, just say, the shape is bent. The geometry is tetrahedral. So as we see here, both the uh, the geometry of both NH3 and water is tetrahedral. Why? Because because we have an object with two electrons here, an object with two electrons here, an object with two electrons here, and an object with two electrons right here. Tetrahedral, four-sided. They're going to have to spread themselves out, creating a four-sided figure. However, we can contrast that with geometry, or should I say um, shape, I'm sorry, where we only look at the, <clears throat> the atoms, and we see that this is trignal pyramidal. It's not trignal planar because this lone pair of electrons is repelling the electrons involved in these bonds, so it actually pushes them down. And so they form a, like a three-sided pyramid, trignal planar. Or, sorry, trignal pyramidal, three-sided pyramid. Now with H2O, we have four areas of what we call electron density or electron domains. There are places where electrons are, four locations, so four electron domains. And because we know that electrons repel one another, they'll spread out into a tetrahedral orientation. But when we talk about shape, we're only referring to the atoms. So the shape of water is bent, is bent or angular. Some books will use the term angular. So again, unshared electron pairs repel each other more strongly than bonding pairs do, which is an interesting little tidbit. This is why bond angles in ammonia and water are somewhat less than the anticipated for tetrahedral 109.5 uh, degree bond angles of a perfectly tetrahedral molecule. The atoms attached to a central atom spread out from each other as much as possible. But how does this model explain the geometries of molecules with non-bonding electron pairs? The nitrogen atom in an ammonia molecule has one non-bonding pair of electrons. These electrons also repel the adjacent atoms and do so even more strongly. The atoms, therefore, are pushed closer to one another. We can predict the geometries of molecules by considering the locations of all the electron pairs in the valence shell. Phosphorus trichloride, for example, is made up of a central phosphorus atom attached to three chlorine atoms by single bonds. Consulting the periodic table, we see that phosphorus has two valence electrons in s orbitals and three valence electrons in p orbitals. The chlorine atoms all have seven valence electrons, one empty spot in one of their p orbitals. So each of the single p orbitals in phosphorus must be bonded with the single p orbitals in chlorine leaving a lone pair of electrons on one side of phosphorus. According to our model, the geometry of phosphorus trichloride, therefore, is not trigonal planar, but rather trigonal pyramidal, with the chlorine atoms bent away from the lone electron pair.
So the same basic principles of Vesper theory uh, that have been described so far can be used to determine the geometry of several additional types of molecules, such as an AB2E, AB2E2, AB5, or AB6. Now, in your textbook, there is going to be the exact same table on one page that I'm going to show you on the next slide. But all I'm seeing here, those E's, like E and E2, they represent lone pairs of electrons. They're electrons, right? Electron pair, an electron domain. And so here are some key things that you want to memorize. Treat double and triple bonds the exact same way you do single bonds. In terms of the overall uh, uh, geometry, there's no difference. How that uh, affects shape does not, does not, actually does not affect shape. And we also want to treat polyatomic ions similarly to molecules. Like I already said, the next slide shows several more examples of molecular geometries determined by Vesper theory. And so again, these two tables, um, you will see them in your textbook. We have linear, bent, also known as angular in some books. We have the trigonal planar. We have the tetrahedral. And in this table, we see uh, what it looks like in terms of shape. We see how many atoms are going to be bonded to the central atom. We see identify the number of lone pairs of electrons. We see the formula, an example, an example of the formula. And then we see the Lewis structure of that example. Now, you are not going to be able to use this table on the quiz or on the test. You will be able to use it on a quick write or while you work out sample problems or uh, complete your worksheet. But the reason that these are so useful is so that you can recognize the pattern. And yes, there most certainly is a pattern that you can get very, very used to. And that's what you're being required to do right now. So let's work another sample problem. It's a two-parter. <coughs> a, use Vesper theory to predict the shape of a molecule of carbon dioxide, which is CO2. And then B, use Vesper theory to predict the shape of a chlorate ion. Remember, we're supposed to treat polyatomic ions very similarly to molecules. So let's give it a shot. And this is a sample. So first, let's draw the Lewis structure of carbon dioxide. I have my central carbon. Each uh, The carbon is double bonded to two different oxygens, and we're good. Uh, there are two carbon to oxygen double bonds, as you can see. But because the carbon has four total bonds, right, two double bonds, there are no unshared electron pairs on the carbon atom. So that means that there's going to be no pushing of those double bonds down in either direction. So this matches the format of the AB2 molecule, which is linear. And let's uh, associate that with something that we already looked at. Linear AB2 with no lone pairs, linear. Doesn't this look familiar? Replace this with a C and then two oxygens on each side. Number of atoms bonded to the central atom. Number of lone pairs of electrons. Molecular shape. It is linear geometry. Let's go back to where we were. Pick up on part B. Let's uh, first draw the Lewis structure of the chlorate ion. Right? So this would be the appropriate chlorate. Um, we have the chlorine, which is central, with three bonded oxygens and a lone pair of electrons on the chlorine atom. Notice that there are three oxygen atoms bonded to that central chlorine. And remember, chlorine has that lone pair of electrons. So this matches the AB3E format, which is trignal pyramidal. Right? It's going to be trignal something. It's going to be trignal something because you have three bonded atoms. Is it going to be trignal planar or trignal pyramidal? The easy answer to that is looking at that lone pair. That lone pair on the top of chlorine is going to push the bond angles of the chlorine oxygens down to create a pyramid. So trigonal pyramidal. <clears throat> now we're getting to something that is very difficult to uh, wrap your head around why we need it. But if you can wrap your head around why we need it, uh, the actual content makes total sense. It's called hybridization. Vesper theory is useful for predicting and explaining the shapes of molecules. We already know that. A step further must be taken, however, to explain how orbitals of an atom are rearranged when the atom forms covalent bonds. For this purpose, we use the model of hybridization, 
which is the mixing of two or more atomic orbitals of similar energies on, on the same uh, principal quantum level on the same atom to produce new hybrid atomic orbitals of equal energy. Not just similar anymore, they will be equal. Uh, so let's take the simple example of methane, right, which is CH4. Now you can draw the uh, Lewis structure for CH4, and you would draw a central carbon and four hydrogens bonded to it, all singly bonded. The carbon atom has, therefore, um, sorry, we know that carbon comes to the table with four valence electrons, right? Two in its 2s orbital and two in its 2p orbital. If you were to draw the orbital notation for carbon, you would see that very, very easily. But experiments, meaning real-life experiments, have determined that a methane molecule is tetrahedral. But how does carbon form four equivalent tetrahedrally arranged covalent bonds if there are only two electrons and it's two p orbitals hmm now recall that s and p orbitals have different shapes and to achieve four equivalent bonds carbons 2s and three 2p orbitals hybridize meaning they all get mixed together and then averaged out to form four new identical orbitals called three sorry hmm, sp3 orbitals the superscript 3 on the P indicates that there are three P orbitals included in the hybridization. The superscript 1, which, which you don't write, it's just assumed, on the S is left out, right? It's because it's assumed, just like in a chemical formula. And so there's one S orbital and three P orbitals all mixed together. And so you get four identical sp3 orbitals. And so let's start to picture this. If we take... Just like we said, three 2p orbitals, right? three 2p orbitals, um, a 2p orbital on the y-axis, a 2p orbital on the x-axis, a 2p orbital on the z-axis, along with the, the 2s orbital, and we mix them all together, right? average them out, we get four identical orbitals that don't look exactly like the p orbitals, and they don't look exactly like the s orbitals. They look like a mixture of them. Now, it's not a perfectly 25% sorry, 50% P, 50% S, because three P's went in and only one S. So we added four together. Three of them were P, so three out of four is 75%. These SP3 hybrid orbitals show 75% P character and only 25% S character, right? Because only one out of the four orbitals that were hybridized was an S orbital. So we take these four unhybridized orbitals, right? And then we hybridize them. Now, if we draw the orbital diagram of a carbon atom by itself, we see that there's a two, this 2s orbital. We got two electrons inhabiting that, and we have our two um, uh, single, singly filled p orbitals. However, this is not how uh, carbon bonds. If we use this alone to predict how it's going to bond, we are only going to be able to form two bonds maximum because there are only two unpaired electrons. It means carbon only has two electrons to commit to bonding. Well, like we already established, methane has four bonds. That carbon, that central carbon, definitely forms four bonds. And so what we do is we hybridize one, two, three, four orbitals, three p's and one s, to get four identical energies. See how energy over here on the y-axis, these are all exactly in line. They're the same energy. And so to satisfy Hund's rule, we spread out our four valence electrons into each of these hybrid orbitals until each of them is singly filled. As a result of this hybridization, notice that we have four unpaired electrons. That means there are four bonds possible by that central carbon in hydrogen, or sorry, in methane, which is what we see in real life. So the four hybrid orbitals, in this case is um, an S, a P, a P, and a P, and the sp3 hybridized methane molecule are equivalent meaning they have the exact same energy which is greater than that of the 2s orbital that went into it but less than that of the 2p orbitals which went into it hybrid orbitals are orbitals of equal energy produced by the combination of at least two but sometimes more orbitals in the same atom hybridization explains the bonding and geometry of many more molecules that we wouldn't be able to by using vesper alone and so going back to the example of methane, we took our 1s and 3p orbitals, 
we hybridize them all together and we get four of these sp3 orbitals again four of them right and so what we can do is we can have four electron domains four electrons do electron domains because we have four orbitals available four singly filled orbitals each with one unpaired electron able to form a bond able to satisfy this predicted shape or sorry this uh, observed shape of ch4 being tetrahedral we also see hybridization on water not to say that there are four bonds but there are four electron domains there's an electron domain here in the bond here in the other bond but also here for the lone pairs so there's four areas of electron density, AKA electron domains. In order to have four area, four electron domains, we need four hybrid orbitals. And so if we understand what type of hybridization is present, we can predict what type of shapes we will see. And so we can see the, uh, the geometry of hybrid orbitals. If we hybridize only uh, one S and one P orbital, we'll get SP hybridization, meaning one of each and we'll produce two hybrid orbitals. If we have two hybrid orbitals, that's two areas of electron density, that's gonna be your linear shape, just like that CO2, the carbon dioxide, or that beryllium uh, bi, uh, difluoride, I'm sorry. If we uh, hybridize one S and then two Ps, that'll be SP2 hybridization, we'll get three identical orbitals, now we can form something that is trigonal planar because we have three areas of uh, electron density, three electron domains, three hybrid orbitals. Those are all synonymous. But then if we take all of them, an S and then three Ps, we'll get sp3 hybrid orbitals. We'll get four of them. So we can have four electron domains and make up to four bonds. Going a little bit further, it doesn't stop there. We can also, and this gets a little bit a little, uh, a little bit intense, but we can also dip into the d orbital of the former uh, principal quantum level. And we can actually hybridize 1s, 3p, and 1d orbital. So we actually have five hybrid orbitals. And so now we can get five electron domains. And we can get a shape like trigonal bipyramidal, right? It's still trigonal planar, but it's bipyramidal. Sorry. It's still trigonal pyramidal. It's still a pyramid, but it's a two-sided pyramid, a pyramid that goes up and a pyramid that goes down. And then we can, we can continue to get more intense with sp3, d2. You can count them. That's six total hybrid orbitals to generate our octahedra, octahedral, which will be our most complex shape that we have to be able to identify. And that's it for hybridization. Let's finish up with intermolecular forces. So the forces of attraction between molecules are known as intermolecular forces. The boiling point of a liquid is a good measure. It's a measure of the intermolecular forces. The higher the boiling point, the stronger the forces between the molecules. The lower the boiling point, the weaker the forces between the molecules. Now, intermolecular forces will vary in strength, but are generally weaker than the bonds between atoms within molecules. So that would be an intramolecular force. A bond would be an intramolecular force. Intermolecular forces are generally weaker than bonds. Boiling points for ionic compounds and metals tend to be much higher than those for molecular substances because forces between molecules are weaker than those between metal atoms or ions. Ions are especially strong. And so we can see that by analyzing this data. As you look at ionic substances versus covalent substances, we can see that they're melting, the melting points of ionic substances are very, very high. The boiling points of ionic substances are very, very high. Compared to covalent substances, both the melting and boiling points are going to be much, much lower by comparison. And that shows that ionic substances have much stronger intermolecular forces compared to covalent uh, substances having much weaker intermolecular forces. The strongest intermolecular forces exist between polar molecules because of their uneven charge distribution. And that's how we want to think about polarity, by the way, is an uneven charge distribution. Polar molecules have dipoles. A dipole is created by equal but opposite charges that are separated by a short distance. 
just like the poles of a magnet. The direction of a dipole is from the dipole's positive pole to its negative pole. And that'll make sense when we actually draw the representation of a dipole, how we actually draw it and indicate it. We're pointing to the negative pole. And so a dipole is represented by an arrow with its head pointing towards the negative pole and a crossed tail at the positive end. You can think of it as a positive symbol. The dipole created by a hydrogen chloride molecule would be as in, indicated as follows. We have the HCl, and because chlorine uh, is much more electronegative than hydrogen, it would have an uneven distribution of electrons towards the chlorine, making the negative dipole towards the chlorine and the positive dipole towards the hydrogen. The negative region in uh, one polar molecule attracts the positive region in an adjacent molecule. So the molecules all attract each other from opposite sides. Such forces of attraction between polar molecules are known as dipole-dipole forces because it's two dipoles. Dipole-dipole forces act at short range, meaning only between nearby molecules. Dipole-dipole forces explain, for example, the difference between the boiling points of iodine chloride, which is ICL, and molecular bromine, which is just Br2, showing that Iodine chloride has a much higher melting point compared to, or sorry, boiling point compared to molecular bromine. Because there's no dipole, they have the exact same electronegativity that's going to be perfectly even charge distribution. And so we can compare uh, the strength of dipole dipole forces, again, using the boiling point as a reference point. Not that, that we have to memorize the boiling, boiling point, just see the changes in boiling point and associate that with polarity, or sorry, polar, um, polar substances versus non-polar substances. Dipoles cause polar molecules to be attracted to one another. Although the forces involved are relatively weak and short range, they can still have important effects on the properties of many materials. Bromine fluoride is a polar covalent bonded molecule. The slightly charged ends of the bromine fluoride molecule attract the oppositely charged ends of other polar molecules. Because liquid bromine fluoride has these dipole-dipole interactions locking the molecules together, it has a relatively high boiling point. As the liquid heats up, the molecular vibrations become stronger and the dipole-dipole interactions become harder to maintain. Eventually, the bromine fluoride boils. Similar liquids without dipole-dipole interactions will boil at a much lower temperature. Molecular fluorine, for example, which is completely nonpolar, boils at negative 188 degrees Celsius. Without dipole-dipole interactions, the molecules can separate easily. A polar molecule can also induce a dipole in a nonpolar molecule by temporarily, just for a moment, attracting its electrons. The result is a short-range intermolecular force that is somewhat weaker than a traditional dipole-dipole force. Induced dipoles account for the fact that a nonpolar molecule like oxygen, which is O2, is able to dissolve in water, which is a polar molecule. Normally, you wouldn't think that that uh, can happen. You shouldn't be able to have a nonpolar molecule dissolve in a polar molecule because they don't interact the right way, right? You don't have that dipole-dipole interaction. But as we see on this uh, representation right here, we have water, which is a permanent dipole. It's always dipole. You have two uh, areas of electron density, two electron domains always present in water compared to O2, which has no dipole, right? It's a, it's a diatomic molecule, meaning there's no difference in electronegativity, meaning the distribution of charge is perfectly even, nonpolar in every way. But the negative side of a water can actually repel the negative electrons that would normally inhabit this side of the O2, temporarily inducing, causing the electrons to move away, right? Being repelled, move, uh, causing the electron density to uh, move to this side of the oxygen, creating a partial negative charge, a partial positive charge. And it is the reaction, or sorry, reaction, the interaction between the permanent dipole of water from these lone pairs of electrons and the partial positive of O2 
that allows the dissolution of O2 into water. And that's why fish can breathe. Some hydrogen-containing compounds have an unusually high boiling point. This is explained by a particularly strong type of dipole, dipole force. In compounds specifically containing a hydrogen to fluorine bond, a hydrogen to oxygen bond, or a hydrogen to nitrogen bond, notice that there's going to be a very large electronegativity in all three of those types of bonds. The large electronegativity differences between hydrogen atoms and the atoms that are bonded that uh, they're bonded to make their bonds highly polar. Fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are the most electronegative elements on the periodic table, and so they're going to have the largest electronegativity differences. Going to make them the bonds very, very polar, very, very polar. This is going to cause the hydrogen atom to have a partial positive charge that is almost half as large as a bare proton, meaning a bare proton that has a full positive charge. And so that hydrogen atom, it's not going to be as strong as, a, as a, uh, the charge on a bare proton. It'll be about half as strong. But being half as strong, it's still way stronger of a charge, way more of a charge than any of these other polar bonds. So this is going to be a very polar bond in these, these three scenarios. So the size of the hydrogen atom, because it's so small, allows the atom to come very close. Because it's so small, you get very close to an unshared pair of electrons and an adjacent molecule. Because you can get so close, you can experience the attraction more strongly. The intermolecular force in, in which a hydrogen atom that is bonded to a highly electronegative atom, when we identified fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, is attracted to an unshared pair of electrons of an electronegative atom in a nearby molecule is called hydrogen bonding, even though, this is a horrible name, even though it is not bonding. It is technically a dipole-dipole interaction. <laughs> hydrogen bonds are usually represented by dotted lines connecting the hydrogen-bonded hydrogen to the unshared pair of the electronegative atom to which it is attracted. Uh, an excellent example of hydrogen bonding is that which occurs between water molecules. The strong hydrogen bonding between water molecules accounts for many of water's characteristic Hydrogen properties. bonding. Hydrogen bonding is the intermolecular force in which a hydrogen atom that is bonded to a highly electronegative atom is attracted to an unshared pair of electrons in an electronegative atom in a nearby molecule. In a solution of pure water, the hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom are attracted to a lesser extent to the unshared electron pairs of neighboring oxygen atoms. This attraction between molecules results in a boiling point that is higher than usual. Let's finish up with London dispersion forces. Even noble gas atoms and perfectly nonpolar molecules can experience weak intermolecular forces of attraction. In any atom or molecule, either polar or nonpolar, the electrons are in continuous motion. They are moving at all times. As a result, at any instant, meaning an instant, only one moment in time, the electron distribution may, may be uneven. A momentary uneven charge can create a positive pole at one end of an atom uh, of a molecule and a negative pole at the other. Again, just for an instant, just for a moment be, until the atoms uh, redisperse themselves. This temporary dipole can then induce a dipole in an adjacent atom or molecule. The two will be held together for an instant, just an instant, it's very fleeting, by the weak attraction between temporary dipoles. The intermolecular attraction resulting from the continuous motion of electrons and the creation of instantaneous dipoles are called London dispersion forces. They're called London dispersion forces because a scientist named Fritz London first proposed their existence back in 1930. In any atom, the random motion of electrons around the nucleus can create a positive pole in one part of the atom and a negative pole in another part. If another atom is located nearby, the temporary dipole can induce a dipole in it as well. 
The two atoms are held together for an instant by the weak attraction between the temporary dipoles. Before separating again, as electron motion causes the dipoles to disappear. All right, guys, that's going to do it for Chapter 6. I know there was a lot in this video. It's one of the longest videos of the year. It was some major concepts, but please do not shy away from watching this video a second time or a third time, especially headhunting for information that you do not understand. All right, chemistry, I will see you next period.